thank you for braving this day and being willing to come out and hear a Scottish voice. Um, and I will. I have been told now several times, or asked rather, to try and slow down because as I speak, I tend to get faster. And uh, I just know that this is going to happen. So I, I've got a couple of people who will wave at me. Um, I realize for those of you who English is not your first language, and then you're hearing Scottish on top of that, it's uh, all the more compounded. So my apologies in advance, and I will do my best to speak at a decent rhythm. Life's pursuit and the question of meaning, something that's unavoidable to us all. Some point in your life, many times in your life, you will ask the question, what's it all about? Is there any meaning in life? That's one question. The second question is, well, what is it? <laughs> Not so easy to answer, despite what we might think. A number of years ago, there was a very famous film came out called City Slickers. And in City Slickers, you have a man who's in the middle of his career and, and his marriage and all of his relationships are just going a bit dull because he's, he's not sure what he's all about. And he suddenly goes off with a group of friends out into the west of America uh, to do a cattle drive. And while he's there, he meets this uh, cowboy. And uh, it, as they're going ar along, he asks the man curly, he says, what is the meaning of life? And this rugged looking cowboy holds up his finger and says one thing. Or he holds up his finger and says, well, the meaning of life is your finger? He says, no, the meaning of life is one thing. He says, well, what is the one thing? He says, that is the question. <laughs> you ever ask yourself, why are people, so many of us so constantly unhappy at a deep level? What do I mean? If you do even a basic survey of conversations, of media, there's a deep, deep restlessness in the heart of all humanity. Even when we have money and power and fame, we still always want more. We want perfection or ideals or if I could just get this, I would be happy. It seems that there are intense cravings, unfulfilled longings that rest deep in all of our heart. Whether that's in great tragedies, stories where people try to be heroes and it all goes south, or adventures where they're trying to conquer a kingdom, or romantic pursuits. Always looking, never finding. Now in human history, the 20th century particularly, the 60s was a time of social revolution. It was after the Second World War, particularly in the United States, America was a country that was uh, enhanced by the Second World War because of the money, because the country hadn't suffered itself, like many other countries had, and there was Thousands of young people, the GI Bill, those that came back after the war had been given an education and uh, many had families and children and those kids were born wanting to make love, not war. So there was the whole 60s rebellion and freedom. And throughout the 60s, there in America, but also in the West, in Britain and all across, across the Western world, there was a, a cry for freedom. If we could tear ourselves free and liberate ourselves from authority, from structure, from parents, then we would find freedom and pleasure. The theme of liberation was a theme that came into consciousness and culture, to be liberated from all of the things that restrain us. And there were names like Albert Camus, the Algerian French writer, or Sigmund Freud, of course, from Austria. Music groups like the Rolling Stones, and movies like Easy Rider that celebrated the whole mood that we should be free. In fact, there was a very famous film back then called, with this, the uh, young uh, actor who died, James Dean, called Rebel Without a Cause. But I suggest to you that what happened there was that opened up a stream of thinking where we have today rebels without a pause. The rebellion and, and constantly screaming at the powers is what we do all the time. But here we are in the 21st century and the restlessness has not gone away. And one of the movies that really captures this mood is the film The Matrix. Many of you remember, of course, The Matrix. And in the story you meet Neo. Neo is the hero in the film, or one of the heroes. And early on we find that he's in this meaningless job. And he's a data hacker. And he gets a message sent to him from Morpheus. And so as he goes to meet Morpheus, they have an exchange and talk about this dead existence. And Morpheus says to Neo, Neo, you know something. There's something that bothers you. It's like a splinter in your mind. And he says, it's the matrix. So what is 
the natrix, a sense that life is out of sync, a sense of dis disjointedness, a sense of alienation. Well, here is Morpheus telling Neo what is wrong in life. He said, it's all around us even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out of your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It's the world that's been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth, that you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison of your mind. Now, if you're even familiar with uh, even basic philosophy, you'll know that this is really essentially Zen Buddhism coming through in a modern film. Um, this kind of idea that we are prisoners of our mind and our reality. In fact, Eckhart Tolle, who uh, Oprah Winfrey has helped to sh accelerate to fame in America, has written his book, The Power of Now, which I notice is all over the bookstores here in uh, Singapore as well. But maybe we don't all feel the same degree of desperation or hunger. But you'd have to be blind or not paying attention to the things that are going on around you in culture. If you listen to music, if you watch movies, if you read books, there's a cry from human hearts all over the world that something in life is wrong and something is missing. Paula Schwed, who looks at literature, reviewed hundreds of songs from country music. And she wrote a book called I've got tears in my ears from lying on my back in my bed while I cry over you. Now you have to understand country music in America to get the feel for that. I've got tears in my ears from lying on my back in my bed while I cry over you. Talking about the pains and the sorrow. Here's just some examples from country music in the United States. I don't want no more of the cheese. I just want to get out of the trap. Glenn Barber. Johnny Slate and Red Lane. Ever since we said, I do, there's so many things you don't. Jimmy Buffett, 1985. If the phone doesn't ring, it's me. You're so cold, I'm turning blue. Harlan Howard and Don David. And you see a common refrain, don't you, in all these songs? Disappointment in relationships. Love pursued and love betrayed. Or love as a disappointment. Now this question isn't one of just mere intellectual curiosity. It's not something just about ideas. It's not just about concepts in life. This is an existential cry. It's a cry from the heart. It's a cry from human existence. It's a cry for something beyond ourselves, reaching out for answers to who we are and what we are. Now I want to explore this. What is this thing crying out in the human, the human heart? And I want to raise to your attention what I would call the inescapable power of desire in human life. John Eldridge says this, I have long believed that the journey of desire is the central journey of the soul. I have long believed that the journey of desire is the central journey of the soul. It seems as if we hunger for life as it was meant to be. On the one hand, there are echoes of something that we can't understand. And on the other side, there are dreams of something that we want. So it's like human beings find themselves with echoes coming down their memory lane, calling from something that we don't know what it is. Or dreams of the future, we don't know what that is either. Crying out to us, but it torments us because we want answers. And I think it would be fair to say this morning that no matter what it is that you have, no matter who you are, or how great the moment has been in the last two days, all of us still feel that life is less than we would like it to be. Life is less, or our relationships are less, or something is less. In other words, there's a big disappointment factor somewhere in our experience. Now, what is that, and why is that? Well, that hopefully demands an answer. It's not just a psychological question. It's an existential, philosophical, theological question. Well, consider, first of all, the range and depths of our hungers. I want to suggest to you this morning that it's as if we all have infinite longings but finite capacities. Infinite longings but finite capacities. And that's a problem. If you have hungers that are far bigger than your capacities, where do we answer them? Well, indeed, that's what we need to look for. You see this in the biographies of many famous people. More money than they could ever, could ever be spent doesn't seem to satisfy them. Fame doesn't satisfy them. Recognition doesn't seem to work. 
You see that in the biographies of Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, Kurt Cobain, the young man that blew his brains out sucking on the end of a shotgun. Now you can fill in the blank. And in your life and in my life, many times we sit down time and time without number and say, if only I had the following. If only I could go to the... If only I could... Then I would be happy, right? And you've thought that this morning when you woke up. It's in our lives. We all think that about something. This thing will satisfy me. But it doesn't. And so we get to a place often when we're so disappointed that disappointment begins to rule. And sometimes for some of us, we become depressed, discouraged, and we give up hope. Alexander Pope, a poet during the Enlightenment period, said this, Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. Well, that's one way to answer the question. And that's been also one of the historical answers. Become a Stoic. Just basically die to desires. Become a Buddhist and, and achieve nirvana, nothingness. Extinction. There is no you, the doctrine of non-self. You just no longer exist. But the problem is you have to desire not to desire. And this desire thing is inescapable, it seems, as a part of our humanity. And even though we want to have detachment, we're trapped by the fact that we are thriving, throbbing, hungering creatures. It's a part of what it means to be human. Now, consider secondly the hints of something more or something better or something greater that we get from everyday life. David Aikman uh, was a one-time uh, Time journalist for Time magazine. And he wrote an excellent book called Heart, Hope, the Heart's Deepest Quest, or Hope, the Heart's Deepest Longing. Even in the most life's most frustrating moments or darkest times, there seems to be something that beckons us higher to look up and look out. We don't know quite what it is. The sociologist Peter Berger calls this signals of transcendence, that there's kind of something signaling to us that there's more to life than meets the eye. Barry Morrow, in his book, another book, talks about intimations of heaven. Hints, little signposts in the universe that speak of something greater. David Dark, who studies uh, popular culture, wrote a book called Everyday Apocalypse. And the word apocalypse means an unveiling, an opening up. So you said that in everyday stuff, in music, in language, in literature, we see an apocalypse often, unveilings, pictures of things going on. And he brings, as one of his uh, evidences, the Simpsons. Now, um, do any of you watch The Simpsons? Simpsons are the cartoons that have been going on for years, and many people like them because although it's all very dysfunctional at times with Homer and Bart and so forth, there's also a lot of resolution that goes on within this family. And here's what David Dark, studying The Simpsons, says. He says, in a manner consistent with all great comedy and literature, The Simpsons refuses to collapse or reduce the paradoxical state of the human condition. As what might be described as the way of fondness is affirmed repeatedly in the series. We also know that it's a, it is the failure of character to value themselves and one another properly that drives each half hour plot to some fitful, surreal and occasionally healing conclusion. The characters don't see their values of who they are. They don't see how significant they are in each other's life. And yet somehow, as they blend together in this broken, damaged little community, things seem to work out. He cites many other examples, but he says The Simpsons is an illustration. He said The Simpsons often ends with a moment of communal amazement in which some or all of the cast are made to understand that the world is not what they assumed or expected it to be. The world doesn't quite work out the way they want. In other words, there's more to life than meets the eye. There's more to life than meets the senses. Now, a third issue I would like to cite to you is what I would say our deep longing for certainty, assurance, or finality. Human beings, we want to be certain. What about? Well, everything. We want to know. And we want to know that we know. There's a deep, deep hunger to try and understand what life is all about. Now, in Europe, we, in the Western world, there was a period called the Enlightenment, and it went on to affect, obviously, the rest of the world. The Enlightenment was a philosophical awakening where we're going to throw off the bondage of religion and priests and kings and that man would be in charge of his own destiny. With the power of reason, he would shape a brand new world. He would shape his future. And education and experiment and science would give us progress 
and we, we would together build a brave new world. And it was great hopes. If you read literature, particularly from the 18th, but, but the 19th century, there is a tremendous sense of optimism. Optimism that science is coming, that, that rational powers are so strong and so powerful, and science is such a terrific tool that we will solve sickness, we will solve poverty, we will solve war, we will solve everything. Alexander Pope said this, wrote a poem in the midst of this, and just this is one little quote from one of his poems, Presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. In other words, don't be bothered with the heavens. Don't be bothered with things that are out there. Concentrate on the real world, the concrete world, the physical world, the world before us. Well, they did. For several hundred years, actually. A couple of hundred years. They did it with gusto, with strength, with power, with imagination. They went out around the world trying to build their empires and, and educate and bring everybody into the same paradigm of reality. How did it work out? Well... Not very well. There were some good things, many good things. Have we had tremendous scientific breakthrough? Of course. Have we had great economies? Absolutely. Have we had democracy and these things? Yes. But it also brought unintended consequences. Not just at the material level, because it seems as we got more materialistically uh, and more educationally and, uh, informed, we developed, we lost more and more of what life was about. In other words, purpose and meaning, contentment, satisfaction seemed to disappear. And so we went from the illusions of modernity to the disillusioned deconstructions of what we call post-modernity. Where the one thing that people know in society today is that you know that you cannot know. Well, there's a good statement. How do I know? Well, the one thing I know is that I know that I cannot know. Do I know that? Well, I seem to know it because some great philosophers and universities tell me that I know I cannot know. But they write books telling me that I know that I cannot know, so they want me to know that I cannot know, which undoes their whole project, doesn't it? How can you know that you cannot know? If you know that, you know something, and therefore you know. So we've just refuted their whole project. But they go on to write hundreds of pages to tell you why you cannot know. But you've got to know that you cannot know. Do you see what I'm saying? So what? Now, postmodern times and the ever-present discontent. There are some human beings who give their life, their energy, and their thought to studying how we think, why we think, what we do, why we do what we do, because they want to try and figure it out, because they want to try and fix it. Some of these are names like Ernest Becker, who wrote a very famous book, The Denial of Death, and many others. Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, who represented a school of sociological analysis called the Frankfurt School. They were very interested in how cultures are constructed, how mythology and ideologies, the search for heroism, takes place in a culture to guide us and so forth. And the book of the denial of death, I found, is a, is a very interesting book to show that as human beings, we run away from the fact that we are mortal, that we are limited. That death has an appointment with 100% of humanity. And it's one that we all must keep. So if we don't have a philosophy of life, if we don't have a view of life that answers the questions of existence and the problem of death, then we're really going to struggle, aren't we, in life? because we're constantly trying to put it out of our consciousness. Now, how do you answer these kinds of questions? You might not be the person, kind of person who likes philosophical or theological reflection. How do we answer these questions? Leslie Stevenson of the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and David Haberman of the University of Illinois in America wrote a book called 10 Theories of Human Life, 10 Theories of Human Nature. And they show that all worldviews, all books, all systems do give us four things about reality. They provide, first of all, a background theory of the nature of the world. What is the nature of the world? And by the way, that's the central question in the matrix. What is the really real and how do we know? That's the question that Morpheus is asking to Neo. Secondly, they provide us a basic theory of human nature. Who and what is a human being? What are we? That's an important question. Thirdly, what is it that's wrong with us? A diagnosis of the human condition. Are we just uh, material creatures subject to chance and necessity? And if we can solve the class, racial, and economic problems, life will be wonderful for us? We'll live happily ever after? And fourthly, a prescription for putting things right. 
Now, I haven't got time here to do an exhaustive run through the global tour, but what I'm going to do is give you three contemporary views that masquerade for life. Because people are selling us life, don't you agree? You go to school, you get a vision of life. You go to university, you get a vision of life. You turn on the television, you get a vision of life. You watch a movie, and it's telling you not only what you should live, but how you should live. So let's see some examples that are probably the big ones in our life today. The first choice to find life is the unlimited choice or the market becomes a metaphor. Life is unlimited choice. Many people think that that's what life is all about. Just having choices, more of them, multiplied. Now, since I've been traveling now for 30 years globally, I've watched the spread of global markets been in places where they've developed, watched them come in and change and transform cultures. India is a case and example. Uh, many other places where markets come in and begin to transform old structures and old habits and patterns of life. But buying and shopping isn't necessarily for everyone for at least two reasons. First of all, not everybody wants it in the first place. Not everybody's satisfied with having stuff and more stuff. Some people that doesn't light their fire at all. But secondly, not everybody can get access to it. There are many people because of poverty, because of politics, because of all kinds of other reasons, they, are, they don't have access to the markets. But the notion that you are what you consume is very important. And I would say it's very important in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, isn't it? You can tell it by the way that people buy stuff, where they live, what they have, how they appear appearance and the kind of plastic bags that you carry. I've been uh, pointed out that I carry a little white shopping bag that I put my stuff in, but it doesn't have the right logos on it. But it, you know, branding and brand consciousness is all about our lifestyle, isn't it? Because we want to have an identity. Now, James Twitchell of the University of Florida pointed out something a number of years ago, and I was reading a book on this that I found very interesting. In studies of spirituality, Many people in different traditions, Christianity and Buddhism, also in Islam, often put a contrast between the life of the spirit and the life of material. So in other words, if you really want to have a spiritual life, you have to separate yourself from the material world. But James Twitchell, who has been studying consuming patterns now for about 30 years, writes that what has happened in the global market today is that materialism is being presented as a form of spirituality. And so going to the mall is like going to the temple. It's just a shopping temple. You consume desire. You buy and you shop and you find your identity. I shop, therefore I am. When the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. And that is one possible strategy for life. Some people try to buy that, literally. But secondly, if you're in the younger set, not necessarily the younger set, maybe life is found as unrestrained freedom. That's why we like reality TV and all these kind of things. Jacques Berzon, who wrote a book on uh, 500 years of cultural history called From Dawn to Decadence, points out that in deep the Western world, there was a desire, first of all, for, emancip from, for enlightenment, education, knowledge, truth. But that enlightenment was to give us emancipation so that we would be free. The knowledge wasn't just knowledge in itself. It was knowledge with a purpose to liberate us, to set us free. And this is what many people believe life is all about. That's what it is I want. If you go to universities, you go to colleges, you go to school, high schools with kids, what do they want? They want freedom. Yes, what do you mean by freedom? Well, they don't really know. They just want freedom. Freedom from what? Everything. Freedom from parents. Freedom to do what I want, when I want, where I want, whatever way I want, with whoever I want. Well, that's not freedom. That's bondage. That means that you're captive to your inner desires. That's your slave. And of course, those who want this freedom want someone to pay for it and don't want the consequences of this kind of freedom. So if they get AIDS or STDs and they get other kinds of problems or their marriage breaks down or they're fired from their job, they don't want those consequences. They want freedom from consequences. But what kind of a world are we living in? Reality TV brings us into a world where the idea that anything goes is a life to be pursued. So many kids, many adults, many people bored in their marriages run off with another woman or another man. People run off to try drugs or run off and try this. And then they find out that they're not free. Martin Luther, 
The Reformed theologian once said, a fish is free on water, it's not free on land. So we have to know what freedom is, but to know what freedom is, we need to know who we are to exercise freedom. Maybe you'll pursue freedom and find yourself in trouble because the freedom isn't freedom. You're, you're free putting yourself in bondage. But the third, and this is related obviously to the previous two, is life is unrestricted pleasure. The permanent party is a metaphor. I get tired of seeing this in the United States, you know. The word party, woo woo woo, and all these little girls, you know, screaming and yelling, Aah! you know, everybody's drunk and losing it and, you know, covered in pouring beer down their navels and people are licking it out. I mean, it's just sheer back and alien stupidity. But this becomes, to us, we're told, this is real life. Boy, imagine going to one of those parties. Imagine being able to get naked with everybody and drink and drugs and live like, a, like some Dionysian monster. Will that make us happy? Well, you would have to be blind, deaf, and dumb to realize it doesn't. You only need to read the stories of those who have done these things, people who have done it all their life. Look at uh, the, uh, the, um, the founder of the, the group, The Doors. Um, what's his name? Mar Jim Morrison, who ends up, you know, in a drunken stupor, dying in Paris. You know, but man, he went out, he burned himself out. That's what it's like, better to burn out than to rust out, right? Really? Is that the life we want, to get to 25 or 30, where your body is destroyed by drugs or sex or alcohol? There's nothing left. No future, no family, no inheritance, no legacy. Is that really, really worth it? A number of years ago, a movie picks this up that you'll probably be familiar with, the film called The Beach, Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's that this is for Westerners, the idea, because Asia, of course, is exotic, and Westerners, you know, come down here, and a group of them go to Thailand, and they find this paradise, this concealed beach that no one else really has found. And a group of drug-taking, free-living young people have set up, really, a hippie commune in Thailand. And they're on the beach, but of course, what happens, like often happens in human stories, is paradise turns into a nightmare because there are pirates and other people who begin to come and people get killed and relationships fall apart and of course paradise gets shattered because there is something in experience that is like that isn't there we reach out for our dreams but something seems to keep stopping us from achieving them infinite longings finite capacities what is that you see I would say, it's not to say this morning there is no value in pleasure or in things or in freedom. These are all legitimate within their space. It's good to have pleasure. It's good to have freedom. It's good to have some degree of things. These are all legitimate. But they're inadequate in answering the question of ultimate life. They don't bring us to solve the human problem. They're diversions or distractions. Now, I want to give you a modest proposal from the Bible that I think is offers an alternative. Who is Jesus Christ and why is that important? Well, that's the question. Is Jesus or is he not the Son of God? Is he God incarnate, God become man? And if so, what difference does that make? Well, I want to suggest to you it makes all the difference in the world. In Matthew chapter 11 and 28 through 30, Jesus says these very famous words. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if Jesus is indeed God in the flesh, the first thing that we get from this is that life is found in the context of a relationship. That the invitation in Christianity is an invitation not to God as an abstract being, not as to God as an impersonal force, not to a blind energy or to morality. It's an invitation to know God in a living way. It seeks to address those who feel the burdens of life. Jesus says, come to me, those of you who labor and are heavy laden. Now, if you're not laboring, if you're not heavy laden, if you're not struggling with life or issues, then you'll have no reason to come. But the invitation is there. If there is a sense of pressure, if you're struggling, Christ offers an invitation. And he promises rest. He promises that he will meet us. And he involves, it involves a new way of living and a life of learning. And on a very simple level, this is not hard. It's an invitation. And an invitation merely has to be accepted. It's free 
but it costs you everything. That's a paradox, isn't it? It's free because it's a grace offer, but it costs everything. Now, I want to give you four things that my colleague Ravi uses and tells us about life because I've been talking to you about the journey of desire and meaning of life, and I want to talk about four things that I believe that Christianity answers uniquely. And I heard Ravi sharing this, and it just, I've been thinking on it for a number of years, that four things that we must find in our life to satisfy our human desires for meaning. And the first is a sense of wonder. We often like with little children, you know how little children have that sense of playfulness? Um, I love it, particularly Christmas time. I always love Christmas. I like Christmas trees, and I lived in Austria for 20 years, and Christmas in Austria was very, very special. You know, just a beautiful time, and snow, and, and sm special smells as we're cooking, and tr Christmas trees, and beauty. And But when children are there, Christmas is so much better. Because the kids see the presents, and they ca they're caught up in the excitement. And we watch them as they open those things, and their sense, their little eyes sparkling as they get something that they, they, they never imagined they were going to get. A gift, a mystery, a present of some kind. The sense of wonder. And children are like that when they're playing, isn't it? You take a little, you meet a little child and you may sort of start throwing them in the air and he says, do it again. You throw them in the air and do it again. Throw them in the air, do it again. And after about five times you're ready to sit down, the child's still, do it again, do it again. His sense of wonder is inexhaustible. Wonder and the sense of wonder is a part of what it means to be human. Do you have a sense of wonder? Do you have anything that you can attach the sense of wonder to? It's something that tells us something about ourselves. But the second issue that we develop in life is our hunger for truth. Very early on, we find out that truth is important. We want to know what truth is. We want people to tell the truth to us. And we begin to find that truth is important. So I have to have in life a sense of truth and the value of truth as I go through life. But the third thing as we mature in our life is we want love. To receive love, but to give love. We want to be loved by our parents, by our friends. But we also want to find that love of our life so that we can give love, because love is a giving thing, isn't it? And we need love. What is love? How does love work? Where can I find true love, real love, a love that will penetrate to the depths of my heart? Well, of course, again, that's one of the things that Christianity speaks to very directly. But the fourth thing, and I'll come back to this, is the question of security. When we want to be safe in life, we want to be secure, we want to know that we're covered, we want to know that we're protected. But you see, these four things, wonder, truth, Love, security, these aren't aspects of just one part of our life, like the child wants wonder, the old person wants security, the young man or woman seeks truth, and everybody wants love. But you want all of these things all of your life. You want them as an adult. You want them as a grandparent. You want them throughout your life. So we need to find something in the universe that corresponds to these things. And I believe that that's what God offers us in the cross, in Jesus, in the giving of the gospel. That God is a God who has transcended his image. So he's a being of infinite goodness, holiness, purity, power. Therefore, he's a wonderful being to be worshipped. He's a God of truth because Jesus said it in John 14, I am the truth. He's a God who can be loved, but not just who asks us to love him. He tells us he loves us. Not because of who we are but because of who he is. And he offers us security. Wonder, love, security in God. Well, let me just begin to sum this up. C.S. Lewis, who is a professor at Oxford University and Cambridge, said that one of the reasons that we as human beings get messed up is because we get uh, the order of our loves wrong. And he says there are first things in life and there are second things. If you get your life right in the first things, then the second things will work out. If you make the second things the first things, you get neither. In other words, sometimes we pursue love from sex, or we pursue wonder from our, you know, looking, experiencing things, or security through money and fame and fortune, and it doesn't deliver, because we're not looking in the right place for what it is. Now the Bible says this, the issue of your heart is very important. In a little book in the Old Testament called the Book of Proverbs, there's a verse that says, guard your heart with all di diligence because from it flow the issues of life. Now here's the psychologist Gerald May talking about the human heart. He said, there's a desire within each of us in the deep center of ourselves that we call our heart. We were born with it, it's never completely satisfied and it never dies. We're often unaware of it, but it's always awake. 
Our true identity, our reason for being, is to be found in this desire. So what I'm suggesting to you is that those desires, those indicators, they are signposts, they are longings, they are hints, and you need to follow those. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that God has put eternity in our hearts. The French writer Blaise Pascal said there's a vacuum in the human heart that only God can fill. Now here's John Eldridge, who wrote the book The Journey of Desire. He says, when we don't look for God as our true life, our desire for Him spills over into our other desires, giving them an intimacy and urgency they were never intended to bear. In other words, if we don't find satisfaction in God, we transfer the worship or the affection, the reverence that is due to God to things around us. Maybe it's our job or our personality or sport or education or our family, fill in the blank. But those things cannot satisfy us. There are many, 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 many a woman and many a man who thought that if I can get this career, then I'll really be happy. Or if I could just have the perfect family. And they get the career, they get the family, and they're not happy because they're transferring something they can only find in God to something in the immediate world, and it doesn't do it. It's not a question with living with some other ultimate, ultimate commitment, but searching for what is real life, and where is it found? Well, secondly, when people come to this question, uh, you may be thinking about God or not in your own life, or you may already be in the Christian faith or a religious faith. Many people see it as an all or nothing work versus what I would call a best fit scenario. What do I mean? You can come to these questions in a very, apt, a very unrealistic manner. Some people, as I travel around and I speak about God and speak about Christ in Muslim countries and atheistic, to atheistic communities, to agnostic people and all kinds, sometimes people say, well, if I don't have absolute proof, then how can I believe? Well, the question is, what do they mean by absolute proof? That means they're, they're doomed to live in permanent agnosticism. Now, faith is not a blind leap in the dark. When the Bible invites people to have faith in God, it's not to jump into some unknown. It means that when I see these signals and I see these signs and these hints of transcendence that there might be a God, that He might exist, that He does love me, that He's giving me an invitation, faith is an exercise of trust that becomes a relationship, it becomes the connection point. Let me give you an illustration. When cell phones first came out, a lot of people wanted to have a cell phone. And there were a lot of people pretending they had a cell phone who didn't have one. What do I mean? There were mock-ups, pretend cell phones. They weren't real cell phones, but people walked around, yeah, yeah, talking to themselves, to a piece of plastic. There was no actual phone. It looked like a cell phone, but it didn't work because it had no innards in it and it had no connection but they wanted to have the appearance like everyone else. Well, let me just put this, if you want a real cell phone and you want to commit, you've got to buy the cell phone and it has to be connected to a provider, Singtel or one of the others, right? And then your, your phone connects to the system, then you have communication. Well, faith is like that. You're a human being made in the image of God, by God, for God. You have the software, if you like, but you don't have the connection until you establish your God Singtel. And that then brings you into communication connection with them. And for the moments before that, right up until that point, God doesn't exist. It's an idea, you know, it's just a concept. The minute you establish the connection, all of a sudden a communication is opened up, a transformation in our being. And you can have a reasonable faith, not a blind leap in the dark. But it means weighing up arguments, evidences, possibilities for God's existence and saying what best fits the data? How do I explain this reality? The things that I've been shared to you, I believe are explained in terms that we are made by God. We're made by God for God and we can only find that satisfaction in Him. The last part is the risk of a relational journey. The very famous Jewish philosopher by the name of Martin Buber helped us to understand that the way you know a thing and the way you know a person, a living being, is a very different thing. You can have an I-it relationship. Like I can have a relationship with this microphone, but not really a relationship. I can touch it, I can talk to it, I can smell it, I can look at it, but it's not a relationship, although I am relating to it. But when I talk to my friend LT here, 
We have a living relationship of communion, exchange, knowledge, love, friendship, ideas, all kinds of things. And it's a constant opening relationship. Because as we grow in this relationship, it continues to yield more and more data, insight, friendship, and depth, as it does also with God. God is not a thing. God is a living being. And he invites us to become knowers through communion, through relationship, through experiencing his love, his forgiveness, his kindness, and to come to him on his terms, not on ours. If God is the supreme being, and if he is the living God, if he is holy, good, loving, and kind, then he responds to the conditions that he sets, not us. In other words, I can't demand of God how I want to know him. I have to respond to the conditions that he sets on how I can know him. And Jesus said, come unto me. Let me close with one of the church fathers who looked at human unhappiness for many, many years. His name was St. Augustine. And he penned these very, very famous words that I think summarize the human condition beautifully. He said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. If indeed we are made by God, if we indeed we are made for a relationship with God, then that rest restlessness will never ultimately be solved until we find the communion for which we've been designed. And that's the beginning, not the end, the beginning of the journey towards the fulfillment of all that we are meant to be. Thank you very much.